I'm Linda van Tolberg for Biz News. Vice Admiral Monde Lubese, the head of South Africa's Navy, has recently criticized Arms Corps, threatening to sever ties with the arms manufacturer due to his failure to repair the Navy's vessels. His statement raises several concerns about the current state of our Navy and Arms Corps. And to help us understand the situation, we have Quibus Mare, the DA Shadow Minister of Defense, joining us in the Biz News studio. Hi, Quibus, how are you? Good morning, Linda. Uh, so fantastic to talk to you about uh, all these matters again. Well, can we first of all start with his statement? Is it feasible for the Navy to sever ties with Arms Corps? Uh, that's a very uh, bold statement um, by the Chief of the Navy. Um, while I have got enormous empathy uh, with him for you know the state of the Navy and how dilapidated the the vessels are and how poor, you know, the support services are to do the upgrades, the maintenance, um, you know, those essential things to get the vessels on the water. Must one remember that Arms Corps is a fully state-owned company. Uh, It reports to the Department of Defense as part of its budget, gets its money from the Department of Defense, uh, for which the, obviously the minister has got oversight. So, um, you know, the whole unbundling of Arms Corps many years ago into Danell and Arms Corps as it is, uh, there was justification for that, but the, the role of both Arms Corps and Danell has changed totally. Uh, and to a certain extent, one must really question the the um, legitimacy and, and the sustainability of both these organizations as they are today. Now, part of what they have seemingly tried to do over a number of years is not only for Arms Corps to try to find business to sustain itself, but also to position itself as a as as the preferred service provider to the um, to the South African Defense Force and in this case, the Navy. And uh, some years ago, you know, the dockyard was then transferred to Arms Corps to manage the dockyard, to then do all the um, maintenance on the Navy vessels, to do the midlife upgrades, uh, and to, uh, you know, make sure that the frigates and the submarines are, again, fully serviceable to be deployed. Um, That we know and have experienced over many years has not worked out precisely like that. I think, first of all, because Arms Corps in its positioning as a service provider is not ideal because they are actually a contracting agent for the Defence Force for its, um, you know, munitions and also prime mission equipment. So whether uh, Arms Corps is the right um, player to really run the dockyard, I am not so convinced about that. We know that there are private sector, defense industry, role players and stakeholders uh, that has got a much better uh, track record um, of, of, uh, you know, servicing and delivering, um, you know, vessels. We know that, for instance, the current experience with Diamond Shipyard in Cape Town with the delivery of the three multi-mission inshore patrol vessels, they are not only um, within the time frame, but also within the budget the original budget. So that is a proof of the of the capabilities of the private sector and compare that to state owned enterprises, whether that's the dockyard within Arms Corps, Danielle, or any of the other state owned enterprises, and then you will see that that is, in my opinion, you know, put to put it lightly, an enormous failure um, of service delivery and that has contributed significantly to the um, dilapidated state of the Defence Force, and most certainly of the of the Navy. So yes, um, it is it is a bold statement, but there there needs to be political will and a political decision making. Now, without that, um, you know, the Vice Admiral can talk, and he has also spoken about the need for more vessels, uh, which I support him in. But with the current uh, political support and the provision of resources, I am very doubtful uh, that he will be successful in that. Uh, But with regards to Arms Corps, I do believe that 
Arms Corps and the NEL uh, must be totally restructured and repositioned. Uh, maybe not as two separate organizations, but one uh, in support of the Defense Force and its needs. Um, and, and that where the private sector can provide a much better uh, and a reliable service, and maybe in some cases even an affordable service, uh, we must really look to the private sector to to drive this needs, but also drive the economic economic development uh, and the and the job creation benefits that can derive from that. And is this ongoing friction between the two also hindering a, a resolution? Most certainly, most certainly that is the case. And uh, you will interest for interesting find that there's not only the chief of the navy that has got this this friction and frustration. But you also most certainly find that within the um, within South African Air Force, uh, there you might even find it much stronger, uh, and where there is a seemingly a much stronger dislike for the role that the NEL and Arms Corps is playing, and they blame obviously all the delays uh, on Arms Corps, uh, which is not totally true because there's also an enormous inefficiency and an unwillingness uh, among certain senior managers to uh, to bring in the required changes. So uh, that's why, you know, um, unless there's a political will to restructure the defense force and what we require going forward, um, you know, it's unlikely that we will see um, a, a significant change um, and an improvement in the very near future, hopefully. 29 May will bring an opportunity to the voters to say, let's change this. And, uh, and, and, and maybe it is their will that, uh, that we must drive that change. So, but we need to do something. Otherwise, you know, the Navy might just change into being a water wing, which will be a, um, embarrassment and a, and a very sad day for South Africa. And so the, the vice admiral is literally a vice admiral without a fleet, without any vessels. Yeah, that is what will what he will end up, uh, you know, being um, because currently we know that there's only one of the frigates is is partially uh, serviceable. Yes, he's got the two new multi mission inshore patrol vessels, but they are still under on sea trials, uh, and the third one will be delivered seemingly towards the end of this year. But you can't run a uh, a, a, a a navy. Um, and with a coastline of more than 3,000 kilometers and an uh, exclusive economic zone um, much bigger than the surface of our country and an even more bigger surface when you look at our international treaties and obligations. So, so you know, uh, you will be, for all practical purposes, be without, without vessels. So, uh, um, And then you haven't even touched on the technology and the communication and radar and all those capabilities, um, those high high-tech capabilities that you require as force multipliers. So uh, God forbid that we must get, you know, a disaster on our, on our, you know, seas around South Africa, especially with this increased commercial maritime traffic uh, due to the problems in the Red Sea. Um, but yes, I mean, we have got a, we've got a huge challenge. And, um, you know, I don't think people realize the enormity of, um, of this, you know, dilemma that we are sitting in and the problems that it can cause us for uh, it, for the future in terms of foreign investments and confidence with, with foreign investors to uh, to grow our economy and create jobs. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned our coastline of 3,000 kilometers that we have to protect. So the other thing is, you know, how do we prevent exploitation of our maritime time resources, protect assets like the with communication cables, the port security, the gas plants, and, you know, and smugglers? And, and you know, how can South Africa fulfill its naval obligations if the Navy is in such a state? Well, the short answer is can't. Um, because remember, you know, we also, we don't only rely on the Navy. But we also must rely on the Air Force to do maritime surveillance and patrols. Uh, and we know that currently at 35 Squadron in Cape Town, Esterplatt, uh, we've got no capabilities. So, uh, so, so there's no Air Force capabilities to do that uh, and to fulfill that function. Um, so we are, uh, to a large extent, a sitting duck. And there is very little that one can do. Even the technology that we are using is, is in many cases very outdated. And I sometimes use the um, the you know the comparison of 
uh, you know, we might use still analog technology while our adversi- adversaries are using fifth generation digital tech and satellite technology. Uh, and, and that is what, what we have, what we are facing. Uh, you know, we are seeing in the DRC, for instance, where, uh, you know, those rebels are using surface-to-air missiles, um, you know, precision target uh, mortar bombs. Um, and we know that um, our adversaries um, who has got some bases and surfaces and, and cells in South Africa are using highly, highly advanced technologies. And we are just not there to be one step ahead. So it is a concern. And it is something that uh, we should be addressing. It is something that the commander-in-chief should be aware of and should make changes. Uh, but we don't, unfortunately, see that. Um, so we've talked about the frigates. What is the status of the submarines? The submarines, none of them are serviceable. We know that. Uh, the last one that was partly serviceable was the one that was involved in the accident, um, uh, you know, some time ago. And, um, you know, none of them are, are currently um, sailing. So those are three, um, you know, submarines that one can argue, you know, do we really need them? But the, the, the matter is we do have them. And to, to bring them up to life again uh, and to do those essential midlife upgrades will probably cost in the region of 400 million, 500 million each which is not a lot if you compare that with where we are sitting with overspends um, just on, on cost of employees. We, we will have an overspend on a yearly basis of at least 3 billion rand. So, uh, so with much less than that, we can actually upgrade, do the midlife upgrades of all three uh, frigates, and you can even uh, you know do at least two of the submarines, uh, and then shortly after that, you can do the other one as well. So if the priorities are right um, and the restructuring of the defense force uh, uh, is being done and the reprioritization of of, uh, resources and including money is being done correctly, um, there should be money to do that. Um, But, you know, again, you need a political will and you need um, both um, the restructuring and reprioritization for which you need that political will, and that's that's not available currently. Well, last year there was this joint exercise with Russia and China, and they came with you know really impressive fleets. How was this possible without with um, South Africa having what is known as blue water capability? Well, you know, I was very outspoken at the time, and I think I was proven correct afterwards, and that is that... Um, uh, you know, there's an Afrikaans saying, you know, when you come from a farm where they say, you know, you need a, you need a plier and, and, a, and a piece of wire and you get anything going, you know, at least uh, um, that have the perception that something is going. Now, that is kind of what happened with that frigate that was basically there uh, to show that we have got some presence while both Russia and China came with their latest um, Navy vessels, and clearly, you know, uh, we we played the role of the the useful idiot, in my opinion, uh, that uh, Russia used that as a as a blatant propaganda, where they, amongst others, said that they will launch the the, the hypersonic missile at that stage, which apparently never was the idea, but uh, the official um, news agency TASS has has said that and has published that. Um, and, and then China came with also their latest vessels. They were much more subtle, uh, but I think the message was, was, was brought across that, you know, they have got this capability and all, both of them have got this, um, lovely, uh, partners, uh, ideological partners in the southern point of Africa, uh, that they've got access to. Uh, and in my opinion, we gained absolutely nothing from that. Because in any situation and an exercise, the, the objective must be to how do you get um, uh, benefits that you can apply in your own Navy in this regard uh, and to protect South Africa and to, and to build this cooperation that you can work together uh, for, 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 for the betterment of not only South Africa, uh, but our major trading partners as well. 
because that is what is what is bring, what brings us money, uh, and that is what uh, is making making the whole you know economy in South Africa ticking. Uh, but that clearly was not the case, and uh, I think we were just the useful idiots at that stage because that was in the time of the Ukraine war. Um, and, uh, you know, that was shortly after the, the Lady R's visit to, uh, controversial visit to South Africa. Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, I think we didn't gain anything from that. Nothing. Are there rumors that the Defense Force is um, considering bringing in Cuban experts to repair some of the equipment? <laughs> well, that's an I- ironic question because when we have there, the cu- Cuban experts, uh, you know, as part of Operation Tusano, to um, to to maintain and rebuild our our landward um, you know vehicles and prime mission equipment, uh, I re- recall I have asked them why do we use uh, you know Cuban ex uh, mechanics when we have got all these people that has worked on these vehicles that was part of the construction and the build and the design of these vehicles and these are not. Um, you know, highly technological. You know, they work with carburetors and 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 uh, very, very elementary. Um, you know, technology for that time. Uh, the message was that you know there are no no one available, and even the private sector are uh, you know abusing the 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 opportunities to make more money, um, which is obviously you know rubbish. And uh, I think the the whole operation Tusano has been. Has been found by the, even the Auditor General as being wasteful expenditure and irregular expenditure, and most probably illegal. Um, and uh, and you know, yeah, a few few vehicles has been has been you know repaired and maintained. But in my opinion, that that was also possible with the use of ordinary South Africans to provide them jobs. This is actually, you know, stolen jobs from South Africans. Remember, we have got very good examples. For instance. OTT te- Technologies, who has got a subsidiary, uh, who military veterans are the majority shareholder in that in that subsidiary, and they have upgraded um, rattles and samples and 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 cuspers to the extent that um, you know Burundi and Rwanda and those countries have uh, bought it from them, and they are using it currently, even in Cabo Delgado. And in some cases, those old South African prime mission equipment is in a much more uh, reliable state than what we are currently using. Um, so, so that is also, you know, rubbish in my opinion. It is, it is not justified. It was pure political payback. Um, and remember, it was also in that time that they have tried to to smuggle this Cuban medicine in uh, under the so-called uh, project to sign a contract which didn't provide for that kind of thing, but they have tried to manipulate that. Um, and, you know, there are a couple of generals in the in the Defense Force and even more at that time, part of the Military Command Council, which I've referred to and still referring to them as uh, Mr. Cuba and, and, and Monsieur Cuba. Um, because, I mean, everything was Cuba. Everything was, you know... So I would not be surprised if they do that. However... I don't think that Cuba has got the naval uh, capabilities and the naval, um, uh, uh, you know, history uh, that they can that they can rely on to do that. Um, that'll be ridiculous, um, and and it's not as easy as as looking after a few mambas and and cuspers as as they've done, especially at the bra. So, um, Kubis, what do you think these strategies sh- should be moving forward? Are we sort of sitting again with a state-owned enterprise where the private sector should move in? Well, in my opinion, you know, when you look at the defense industry, our South African defense industry is highly capable, highly developed, and has got the, 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 the best technology available that they are exporting currently to NATO countries with very, very big success. Uh, and in many cases, we don't even make use of those defense industry stakeholders, uh, their products, and their, their resources and their technology. So so um, there's a lot that can be done. I do believe that there should be a rationalization between the NEL and Corps, 
uh, I should I believe that there should be some research and development going on, which is a non-profit side, and there's a responsibility of government to do that. Um, and I do believe that there are certain divisions within the NEL that is probably of a high strategic importance to us to maintain. For instance, you know, the, uh, the NEL dynamic side, the or aeronautic side, and the landward system side. So, so, and there should be a lot of rationalization taking place. Um, many of the manufacturing that Danel is doing can be done by South African industry companies. They've got similar products that uh, that we are trying to procure from abroad. Uh, for instance, the the Badger under the, the Project Mufaster. Um And I do believe that uh, you know there are there are roles for them to play. But you know, state-owned enterprises should not be you know the key or stakeholder. It should be the private sector. And we should, in my opinion, um, you know, involve the South African defense industry um, and the and 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 the resources that they've got access to uh, with their international partners and positioning that can that can very much benefit us to 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 restructure the defense force uh, to reposition a, a a smaller defense force but a more capable defense force um, and also especially. You know the use of technology. Um, I mean, here we sit with with Meltcore, for instance, with a very, very highly capable uh, UAV, which they're manufacturing in in Cape Town. It has got a it's got a reach of a couple of thousand kilometers. Uh, can very easily be used as a reconnaissance uh, and surveillance vehicle on our maritime um, uh, domain and the EEZ. Um, and uh, I mean, they, you can go to each of the, of the defense industry companies in South Africa and each one has got a capability and a contribution that they can make. Um, and you know, in a, in a very simple way, if you want to resolve the problems of the defense force and its defense capabilities, you can bring around the table a number of these stakeholders, if not all of them. Uh, and I know that most, if not all of them, want to see South Africa uh, being successful with a defense force, want to play a, a, a role um, from, 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 you know, from their perspective, it's very important. If the defense, if your local defense force is not using your technology and your equipment, or they, they are so poor as we are at the moment, then it's bad for their business as well. So, so it's also in their international interest to, to, to make sure that we are well restructured, well positioned, and that we are a, a strong defense force. Any modern democracy, anyway, in my opinion, need a strong defense force. It's not also the insurance policy that we need. It, should we need a defense, defense force to defend us? But it's also a deterrent for those who might have the, the inclination or the objective you know, to do us harm or to use us or abuse us for the wrong reasons, as you have mentioned clearly. So is this capability at the moment not used, this capability that is in the private sector? No, it is not used in a very, very large extent, uh, to, mainly because of the, of the budget that we do not have. Remember, even with the current budget that has been announced, it is, it is in, in real terms, in nominal terms, in nominal terms, it is smaller than the amended budget of last year, uh, October. So, uh, so with that and the fact that they have now deployed additional 2,900 soldiers, which will cost us an additional 2.4 billion rand, um, uh, you know, that will come from the bottom line of the already overburdened uh, defense budget. And the only way and place where they can cut that is obviously primarily at prime mission equipment um, and um, and obviously a training side. But, you know, because they cut at prime mission equipment, that means that there are little money or no money available for for the essential upgrades and especially the replacements um, of old technology and um, older prime mission equipment. So, so yes, it is a, it's a huge challenge. Um, but, you know, um, and I know that they want to contribute. They want to play a role. Uh, I've had many, many interactions with them. 
And uh, I've got no doubt that they that they will and can play a significant role to, to rebuild our defense force and reposition it. So while this is continuing, this large coastline that we have is largely unprotected? Largely unprotected, yes. Largely unprotected, um, um, purely because, I mean, you know, we don't have the capabilities, we don't have the technology, even even um, um, Department of Fisheries and Forestry and, and uh, do not have the capabilities. Um, obviously, we know that the budget has been cut everywhere. It is unfortunately a uh, an election year in that regard, uh, and therefore the government will not spend where it doesn't make a um, you know a voting difference or a possible voting difference. Um, you don't. You unfortunately, th- these things are things that people don't see, don't experience, don't know about. Um, so it certainly do not. And it's unlikely that it will vote, influence their voting pattern in the upcoming election. Well, Kubis More from the Shadow Minister, um, DA Shadow Minister of Defense, thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you, Linda. It's again, being a wonderful experience and a, a privilege and an honor. Thank you.